Well, thank you for joining me again this evening on what will be our last but one of the story times about Pauline Hamilton. One of the things that strikes me about Pauline's life story is how God is so lovely intertwining uh, the normal, the miraculous, and the will and the guidance and all things together. So there's not many stories, but one story in all different things. And it's really encouraging for you and I to see that in the ordinary things, God wants to be there working, doing his will, showing us himself, so that you can begin to see that you don't even have to leave your home to see God at work in your life and in the lives of others. And I hope this has been a great encouragement to you. Tomorrow we'll do a little bit of reflections, looking back, I have a few thoughts on that, but for today, let's see how we do. Questions bombarded, bombarded my peace of mind as I headed for the United States. Where would I settle? My parents had both passed away since I had gone on the mission field. Our old home no longer existed, and I didn't want to inflict myself on our relatives. So, what was I going to do? I didn't feel ready to go to the OMF retirement home. And even though I was coming home because of illness, and I had been supposed to be long dead before this, I just wasn't ready to stop. I think that God had something else for me to do. But I had lots of questions. Where would I settle? What sort of ministry could I do? After 30 years and more away from America, how would I ever fit in again? I needed to find all the usual things to build around my life to make it work. But yet, as I look back over the years, I thought, well, I am his. And through thick and thin, he has been teaching me that. While he claimed his right to sovereignty in my life, he was no capricious despot, but a kind, loving father. And it was understanding that, that I just committed myself afresh to what lay before me. I had my own thoughts, of course. How was God going to make ends meet? I could hear everybody talking about inflation at this time. And yet God had taken care of me in those extreme inflation days in Nanking in China. And then I said, remember how he looked after you when you had everything stolen from you. And I knew that it didn't really matter where I was in the world, God was the same. On my way home, I stopped in England and a friend handed me a card remarking, I think this is especially for you just now. It was a modern translation of Zephaniah 3 verse 17. And the card read, He is silently planning for you in love. It was just the word that I needed, and I have needed many times since. God himself is working things out, even when we don't feel he's at work at all. Not because we deserve it, but because of his love. And this time he wasn't about to forget me. Two weeks later, when visiting a friend in another part of England, I found this verse in practically every room of the house. My prayer changed from, what should I do to show me your plan? Actually, my introduction into life in America was a little bit cat catastrophic. First of all, my plane from England was late into New York. I didn't even have time for the shuttle bus to my connecting flight to Harrisburg in Pennsylvania. And the only way was by taxi from one of the, one of the terminals to another. So short, but the, but the taxi driver tried to cheat me. So that, although it said $3 on the meter, he asked for 15 <laughs> Well, with no time to argue, I gave him 5 And I said something in Chinese and pointed to the meter and just left. I said, is this what America is like now? Hmm. I was breathless and huffing and puffing when I got to the counter to check in for the next flight. I landed on my, I managed to get in the last of all the seats on the plane, sat down or more or less collapsed in my seat. And I thought, is this the way that you're meant to treat people who are supposed to be dying of cancer? Anyway, I made it. In Harrisburg, I was met by most of my family and how old they looked. Well, it had been nine years, but when they looked at me, they thought the same. I was a bit decrepit too. But I found out later that they were not that impressed by my, my lack of vigour and so forth. Some even wondered if I would make the 18 miles to my sister's house. 
in Elizabeth Town. When I went to get my baggage, I discovered it was lost. Well, was this American efficiency, I thought? Mm -hmm. No use grumbling, so I had to spend the next few days in kind of wash and wear. We filled out all the forms, which I was not used to doing, and so forth. The day after I arrived, my sister Dorothy, who had driven up from Florida, fell and dislocated her right arm. So I had to do all the driving. Anyway, I had my driver's license still. So on my fifth day of wash and wear, we decided we would go to the US headquarters of OMF in Robesonia. What a, a nice drive through the rolling hills of Pennsylvania, Dutch country. A talk with the home director made it clear that I was on retirement with no furlough, which meant I was not to be asked to take on any activities for the OMF. And on the way home, I hardly saw the fresh green fields of growing grain broken by the clumps of dense wood in the summer finery, because inside I was standing up. I was not sick enough to be left to vegetate, I thought. In fact, I was feeling fine and I was raring to grow. Being treated like an invalid stirred all the rebellion in me. Well, the Lord did quiet my heart and he did say, yes, you're not vegetate, but you do need to adjust. Well, my baggage was found and everything was in good, good condition. I just had to learn, sometimes things go wrong. You just have to walk by faith. One day we decided to go car shopping. Some days earlier, a long-standing computer error had, been, error had been rectified in my bank account and it fattened up the balance. So with the gifts from my Chinese friends, I was all ready to go off to see if I could find a car. And I just reminded the Lord as we set out how much money I had. I asked him, could you please find me one, just the right one, the right amount? Well, the first place and the only place we went to was the same place that I bought my little Datsun back in 1968. And when we went in, I could not miss the bright yellow four-door Datsun Compact. It answered all my specifications. The car had only just been put on the market. Not only was the price right, but I actually knew the previous owner. Just as impressed with the car's rightness after the test drive, I said to the man, we'll take it. Well, then he discovered that I was going to pay cash for the car, and he, surprised, splurted out and said, oh, well, nobody does that anymore. Well, I pay cash. But anyway, since I'm paying cash, don't you think you can give me a better price? Hmm. I can't do that, he said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay the tax. And so after I wrote out the check for the car and the insurance and the registration, he even had some money over for running expenses. And I called the car Pepsi Bell, because it was my delight. While on the surface, life began to be more routine after those first day, 10 days home, I discovered I had lots of catching up to do. I didn't even understand the vocabulary in the newspapers, the new words, new symbols, and things like IBM and OPEC and SALT, words I had no idea what this all meant. Watching television was no less enlightening because I couldn't understand the jokes. And even after they were explained to me, my friends began to give up and they despaired of me. Really felt very stupid in my first few days and weeks home. Shopping was another shock. I was horrified at the prices. My mind was still computing in terms of what things cost in Taiwan. I just really had trouble shifting gears. Places had changed. Streets, one-way streets. One day I struggled for hours trying to find a friend's home in Philadelphia, a city I had spent eight years living in. And every time I got on what I thought was the right street, going in the right direction, I landed in Robin Hood Dell in Furman Park. And I say that for the benefit of those who know Philadelphia and you know Furman Park if you've been there. Before long, I was tiring, try, tiring of living out of a suitcase. Everyone was asking me where I would settle and when I would settle. Oh, I longed to have an answer for that. And I was praying for guidance, the sort of unmistakable kind of guidance for a big decision like that. So you see, the commitment I made to my master was not just for China, it was for my whole life. I wanted to be where he wanted to be, me to be, according to that statement. You remember long ago that I saw it that day, the three A's and the lines, anywhere, anytime, anyhow, bar nothing. But I was growing impatient and I used to pray, Lord, please, please hurry up. When at last my sister Dorothy was permitted to travel back to Florida, I chauffeured her. What a lovely day, it was October. 
a time that's so nice to travel. Vivid autumn colours followed us until the palm trees and then the citrus groves took over in northern Florida and then the balmy breezes and the lovely beaches until we reached Clearwater and the Imperial Gardens where she lived. Since Clearwater abounds in apartment complexes, we started looking for places to live. But I wasn't really expecting to settle in Florida. I really wanted to go to Boston to be near the Park Street Church, which was my supporting church. So we were really just looking at for a sort of rental or something of that nature. But the longer we looked, the more we began to joke about buying a tent and an army, an army bed because the prices were so expensive. Next thing on my agenda was a visit to Boston. I had planned to spend four or five weeks renewing my acquaintances at Park Street Church and then hoping as I was there that maybe someone would turn up for me to live. Maybe I'd end up in a ministry. Ministry to international students in, in Boston would be great. Well, I filled out all sorts of forms for those sort of apartments for people with low incomes, but he was going to have to do something very unexpected. And he did. A few days before I was to leave Boston, Dorothy called me from Florida to say that there was an apartment available in her complex, Imperial Gardens, if I wanted it. The manager needed to know my answer within two days. Well, in my heart, I knew at once that this was the answer to my prayers. All this time, the Lord had indeed been working silently within me and for me, so that while I had no personal desire to settle in Florida, I was sure that he had a purpose for me there. To arrive in Florida three days before Christmas seemed, well, the wrong time, but then I discovered that that's the time when all the sales start and everything is about 30 to 40% cheaper. So I was able with my gifts from Grace Church in Taichung to cover all my basic needs, getting furniture and so forth, so that by Christmas day, my little apartment was pretty much livable and I no longer had to live out of my suitcase. Some of my neighbors, they thought I was a retired nun. Well, they never met a retired missionary, and for the most part, they never even met a missionary at all. So it took a little bit of time for the barriers to all come down. The last day of 1978, I took as a quiet day to assess the past and to renew my commitment to the Lord for the new year. As I examined my attitudes regarding retirement, the Lord showed me just maybe how much was still negative, and he challenged me whether I was going to throw in the sponge or give up or reach out to new opportunities as long as I could. And this is what I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't know how much time I have to live. The two or three months had already stretched into several years. But don't let me just fritter my time away in idleness or self-pity. Help me to buy up the opportunities that come my way and use them for your glory. You know, with a prayer like that, it's amazing. Opportunities began to appear. Of course they did. And I began to take them up. He was leading me one step at a time. And I found myself claiming in a new way the promise, as your days, so shall your strength be. For a long time, people both in and out of the OMF had been urging me to do some writing, even an, an autobiography. But I really didn't feel I had much I had much to recall because I had no material. I hadn't all of those resources. But when I was sort of looking through the storage that I had set aside, all the stuff in our family home, that's my parents' stuff, I discovered all the letters that I had written to my parents during my earlier years in China and Taiwan. There they were, even in chronological order, all tied with a red ribbon. So I had all my sources of material. Reading through those letters and other material, I could only stand in awe at God's loving kindness to me. And then... While in Pennsylvania working on an outline for this book, I heard, a, I heard a sermon which summed up for me God's working in my life. I don't remember that much about the speaker now or how he developed that sermon. I was too busy getting on in my own head as thinking of these three delightful points he made. He never let me go. He never let me down. And he never let me off. I'm going to pause there because tomorrow is our last day on this book and there only are a couple more pages to that chapter. I want to leave it there because I want to come back to that tomorrow. I think we've heard enough today to be encouraged 
and I hope that tomorrow we'll be able to finish the book, reflect on it, and maybe find ways to pray its truth into our hearts so that this, these uh, six weeks, which is how long you and I have been on this journey together, will be really profitable and we'll not let the fruit of this time, the seeds that have been sown, fall to the ground without praying that God will raise up from that seed some remarkable fruit to the praise of his glory because the story, this story, is now your story, isn't it? Because God has drawn you into this story. He has used this story to speak to you and he's drawing you in and he's saying, we're going to continue this story. Not in Pauline's life, but in your life, in my life, in many other lives. And won't that be a bit of an exciting thing? So let's look forward to that. I hope you have a nice evening. And let's pray that God will bless us and guide us for our final one on this. And then next week, uh, we're hoping in God's will, we're going to start a whole new book about someone whose life is equally challenging and refreshing and rich in blessing, The Hiding Place, which I'm kindly allowed to do with hotter Christian paperbacks. And I hope that we'll be able to take that journey together. So thank you once again and God bless you.